So good morning, everybody. It's good to be here. I'm very grateful to Les and the other members of the Commission and uh, the team for the invitation. Um, I, I, I do have some slides, but what I'm go going to do perhaps is walk around because I, I should be able to switch the technology on and flick it forward. Okay, that's good. <coughs> um, let, let me start by asking a question. Does anybody in the room not have a mobile phone? Okay. Does anybody in the room not have a, a smart mobile phone? Okay. <laughs> so, perhaps we have three smart people in the room. Um, I wish I could say the same about the mobile phones. Um, I'll be talking a, a lot more ab than mobile phones, but I thought perhaps during the time which has been graciously accorded to me this morning, I should take you on a little tour of some of the themes which also dovetail with those that we can see um, when we look at our phones. Um, as as you know, I've been invited here wearing my hat as the UN Special Rapporteur for Privacy. So to a certain extent, I'll also be referring you to some of my work for the UN. And that includes the first report, which I presented to the Human Rights Council on the 9th of March of this year. As you know, this is a brand new post. You would think that the United Nations only needed only noticed that it needed a Special Rapporteur for Privacy several decades after it had put one in for freedom of expression and torture and what have you. But hey, better late than never, I suspect. So I've been on the post since it was created. Um, it was created in March. I was appointed in, I was appointed in uh, July. I started on the 1st of August. And I started receiving my staff. Staff? What staff? Um, yes, I, I actually have one, I'm supposed to have one full timer paid by the UN. The rest, and I found out that it's back to my days as rainmaker. Um, back to my days as rainmaker, either in the law firm or at university. Um, because, as you know, uh, being a university don these days is no longer um, going away and living in an ivory tower. It's no longer publish or perish. It's also bring in the money or perish. Um, but let's 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 try and understand why I am carrying at least four mobile devices, and probably more if I look in my bag. Um, <coughs> yes, okay. Only half of me is a lawyer. The other half is a, an IT software engineer. But perhaps the reason is also that I love to keep them guessing. Um, later on, I'm going to have something to say perhaps about GCHQ and other friends we have around the country. They're always there, you know. It's, um, I no longer need a guardian angel, do I? Um, but what I do, what I do is um, I look at this phone, and this has one kind of um, uh, military-grade encryption, and then I look at this one, and this has another kind of military-grade encryption. And this is the one that um, the NSA and GCHQ used to um, celebrate every time they cracked the la latest code on. I don't know. I'm assuming they've cracked this one too. Um, and this is my plain dumb Android phone, uh, which I use just in case uh, there is some new app which I should be looking at and which I immediately get rid of and which, of course, I won't install on my other phones. But why is this? Because one of the things, and only one of the things that I've been talking about in my report, if you go to my report, whether it's the 9th of March one, the one we have there, or the last one that I've presented on the 24th of October to the General Assembly this time around, you'll see that at one point in the report, I'm talking about much more than privacy. <coughs> and you're, willing, you're very welcome to go along to that section of the report and see what I have to say. But let me try and paraphrase, paraphrase some of it so then I can go to some more exciting things which are happening. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so, 
for the past 400 years, I mean, Les was talking about values first, right? <clears throat> Which values are we going to hang on to? Because to a certain extent, um, that's what I will uh, take away from his um, reflections about Brexit. And of course, um, when you think about Brexit and you try to think, but what exactly are we backpedaling on when it comes to values and human rights? Uh, do we want to do that? Have people realized that that's the case? Have people realized that when Winston Churchill set out and sent a legal team to try and hammer out the Council of Europe's mother document, the Convention on Human Rights, how much Britain and the UK was giving to the world, and especially to war torn Europe, and how much Europe has learned about since then. So you can imagine, and let me digress slightly from smartphones, but I need to put in a bit of context here. You can imagine how challenging it must be to somebody like myself, whose brief says, the world is your oyster, you have 195 member states, absolutely no money, absolutely no staff, and you just have to go out and settle things. And in fact, for you to understand, um, I should also tell you something about my mum. Well, my mother's 84 going 85, and uh, she's a remarkable woman in many ways. Um, for want of anything better to do, she completed her PhD at the age of 82. Um, but while she loves me to bits, I'm quite sure she doesn't really know what I do. And I suspect she's been claiming that since I was a teenager, but that's perhaps another discussion. I shouldn't go there this morning. Um, and uh, really, when my mother saw the news, um, and when I talked about this UN Special Rapporteur business, she told me, so what is it exactly that you do? And I had to think up something pretty fast and said, well, you know, Mum, um, there are actually, when I look at my brief, there are only two things which I don't do. And the only two things which I don't have to solve for the time being is the existence of God and the meaning of life. Everything else includes privacy and data protection. Everything else. So you can imagine when you think about everything else, you say, where do you start? Which country do you start with? So I hit upon an, a not-so-secret strategy, which is, okay, now let me see which, is, which are the most influential countries. At least let me, let me tackle those. You know, you go into the keynote, you go into the influencers, the people who influence others. And, well, I was fortunate to be born in a very nice place, um, though I have lived around a few other places in my life. So I was a born subject of Her Majesty in a British colony, ex-British colony, I should say now, and I know what happens in the 62 member states of the British Commonwealth. The first thing that the Attorney General or the boss lawyer in that particular jurisdiction does is reach out for the UK statutes on the matter to seek inspiration. So the last thing I would want is for the United Kingdom to set a bad example. Because bad, bang go 62 countries if I'm unlucky. And then there's the French, of course. Because then I have another 29 Francophone countries who look, so 62 plus 29, I say, okay, if I manage to get these two on the right path, I'm getting somewhere. And now you can see the bad news when I start flicking through the slides. And of course there's Germany. Because Germany, has been, until this year, that country which learned so much from the war, from the horrors of two world wars, which took the European Convention on Human Rights so much to heart, that Germany has been looked up to as one of the leaders in privacy and data protection. And of course, that's another 27 to um, 46 countries. Um, if I either look at the UK or the, or the Council of Europe with its 47 members, you'll notice 
I'm saying 27 and 46, because the UK always goes its own way. It doesn't really look at the Germans for inspiration. And of course, the Germans don't help, because they don't publish much in English. And you know what it is with the English and the language skills, if you permit me that comment. Um, and of course, if you have lived through so many years, as I have, of chairing uh, so many European committees where I'm trying to cope with linguistic chauvinism by the French and um, sheer bloody-mindedness by the Brits and um, the Germans wanting to have their say, our job is actually to sit down and get the Brits into the mode where they're sprouting common sense, and they do. And getting the French to pass on some of the better part of the philosophical reflections of which they're so capable, and actually some of the laws in which they are. And actually looking at the Italians too, because the Italians have one of the most efficient data protection laws with teeth that we have. Because the Italians know a thing or two about the need to have your police forces uh, with the right kinds of powers to go in and search things. <coughs> so I'm saying this too because trying to hit a three countries which could influence another 120 is openly part of my strategy and it's openly one of the reasons why today some of the examples that I will use come from some of these countries. But let's get back to phones, shall we? Because um, just imagine the uproar we would have in the country if the government turned up and said, and as from tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen, each one of you shall carry a tracking device. <laughs> Can you imagine? But the government doesn't tell us that, does it? In the same way as Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook never told my kids, oh, I want, he told them, I want to connect you, I love connecting people. He didn't tell them, I want to, you know, make more than 100 million on that particular stock market out of selling your personal data. That's not the way he phrased it. But in actual fact, if we're not to beat around the bush, we really need to see what on earth we're doing when it comes to personal policy and public policy, when it comes to a number of our technologies. And let me start with these devices, right? Because many people forget, actually, because things are taken for granted very quickly, but many people forget what kind of a converging technology we're carrying around in our pockets these days. So I think the, the, the one I have least is, is my oldest one, which is now in its fourth year, which is about eight megapixels, but this one is running at above 21 megapixels, and uh, which means in plain English that I can produce high definition still photography, high definition video photography. I can also access the internet. I can send and receive emails. I can wander around on the internet, surf, carrying out my shopping, buy tickets if somebody in the staff has forgotten to put me on the right train or the right plane. Um, and all of this, oh, and besides, I can also make phone calls. Yeah, but, but that's by the by. Because it's, the phone calls only generate a little amount of metadata. <clears throat> but just think of what's happened over the past 20 years, and 20 years is enough. So this is what, my 26th year of owning a mobile phone, right? The first one I had was literally a star candidate for the film Lethal Weapon 4, because it was as big as a brick, I could hit somebody with it and kill it, the battery was lousy, um, and it used the kind of technology where sending a text message was unthinkable, it couldn't do it. The next one, which I sometimes look at those films from the early 90s and say, oh look, that's a flip, flip Motorola, the kind of orange, the one that Orange used to give me when I had an office in London. Um, and you see, and that did, it was GSM, and if you remember, 
It was the first one we could take with us to France when we crossed the channel, we were celebrating the channel and so on. And, and we said, okay. But what's happened since then? All of us, because we're all pleading guilty in the room, with the exception of three people. But they're only guilty of text messages and phone calls. But all of us have been generating mountains, literally mountains. No, I make a mistake. Mountain ranges. Mountain range upon mountain range upon mountain range of metadata. Who we call, when we call. And all our little and not so little electronic footprints and electronic fingerprints, which we've left all around the internet, are of huge interest to companies and governments and, of course, criminals. All of them are interested. And unfortunately, we have seen in some countries the governments and the criminals getting together. And sometimes, in some of the investigations that I've carried out over the years, it's a bit like the last page on George Orwell's Animal Farm. And he looked at the pigs, and he looked at the men, and he, he couldn't tell the difference. Because clearly, in some countries, we've got the governments subcontracting, some hacking, to organized crime. Or is it in others that organized crime is actually using government resources to do the hacking? I'm not going to mention those governments for now, but those of you in the know know exactly who I'm talking about. And it makes life in cyberspace very difficult. But let's go one step further to see how it's not only privacy that I need to talk about. Because in the same way as England and the United Kingdom and Ireland have given so much to the world in many ways, and I, this morning I've only had time to mention Winston Churchill. I used to have, just outside my meeting room in Strasbourg, I used to have a copy of his speech with his handwriting written on it. And I'd, I'd wonder how he must be turning in his grave when he says some of, when he, if he would hear some of the things which are said in the UK these days. Because, let me go back 400 years now, when England gave birth to another right. This time, ladies and gentlemen, an absolute right. Let me, though I don't need to labor the point in, in this audience, which has so, many, so much expertise on human rights, but let me remind you one thing in, a, in the context of the European Convention on Human Rights. Later on, I'm going to talk about Article 8 of the Convention, the right to private and family life. And I'm going to talk about Article 9 of the daughter Convention, Convention 108, which is the European Data Protection Convention. <coughs> and later on, I'm going to remind you that you can only derogate from the right to private and family life and all the data protection rights if, A, you've put in appropriate safeguards, B, those appropriate safeguards are put in by law, they're provided for by law, not permitted by law, provided, so you, you've required a conscious decision by a parliament, and you've had a parliamentary debate about the matter. The next thing is, of course, that you can't do this willy-nilly, you've got to do it only, only in cases where the suppression or prevention of crime is required, where national security is at stake, something nebulous, the economic interests of the state. And only, ladies and gentlemen, may I remind you, if A, it is proportional, it's a proportional measure, and I will talk about proportionality in a minute. And it is necessary in a democratic society. Let me repeat that. Not necessary in a tin pot dictatorship, 
but necessary in a democratic society. So, I put it to you, ladies and gentlemen, that unless a measure meets those basic tests of proportionality and necessity, you can provide for them by law until you blow in the face because any self-respecting court should strike it down. And let's go back to the other right that I was going to talk about. The right to remain silent, which was born in a context which Northern Ireland will recognize so clearly. In the midst of controversy about who is Catholic and who is Protestant and who is not Catholic in the England of 400 years ago, they conceived the right to remain silent, the right not to incriminate yourself. And I ask this very basic of questions, this most basic of questions, is this a value which we cherish? Because while Article 8, while the right to privacy is not an absolute right, we should not forget that Article 6, the right to a fair trial, which we are told will not be, like Article 8, will not be affected by Brexit. Article 6 is an absolute right. And it has been held that the right to a fair trial incorporates within it the right to remain silent. And where am I going, ladies and gentlemen? Where I'm going is that in most countries which have embraced the right to remain silent, that right not only extends to Les, but it extends to his partner or spouse. He or she would not be a compellable witness in a court of law. And now I come to my next question, ladies and gentlemen. Who, or I should say, what knows more about you? Your spouse, your partner, or your mobile phone? And I have never been in a room where the answer to that question was, my partner knows more about me than my mobile phone. Inevitably, in an unprecedented fit of honesty, everybody fesses up and says, okay, this thing knows more about me than anything on the planet. Which is why, in my report, I'm referring to the landmark case in the United States of Riley versus California, where, to my mind, the US Supreme Court justices went far, but not far enough, when they recognized and they said quite clearly, when we're looking at the rights under the various US amendments to the US Constitution, but when we're looking at the Fourth Amendment or the Fifth Amendment, when we're looking at the rights to search and seizure, once again born out of what on earth do you do when a red coat comes to right, go through your house? Because that's when it was born out of. But when you look at the rights of search and seizure, the US justices correctly said that the only way that you would have in a house today the kind of information that you have on a mobile phone, the only way you would have that is if the mobile phone is in the house. Otherwise, it wouldn't be there. And the ubiquity of the mobile phone, the pervasiveness of the mobile phone, most studies show that for more than 70-80% of people, a mobile phone is never more than 10 feet distant. It's always there. You're always using it. It's constantly monitoring what you're doing.
So I think, ladies and gentlemen, that the US court should have taken things to the logical conclusion, which is not to the conclusion that they got to, which is you can only search a mobile phone if you have a warrant. I would like us to go one step further in our deliberations and say, are we really going to allow search of mobile phone with warrants if we wish to hang on to the right to remain silent? Because if you want to kill the right to remain silent, definitively, <coughs> grant access to the mobile phone. You might as well kiss it goodbye right now. And I'm talking about the right to remain silent. Well, what's the use of having a right to remain silent if you have access to somebody's phone? So I don't pretend that I have the right answer to this. All I know is that we're looking at a sizable problem, something we have to do something about, and something which, before looking at the privacy dimension almost, we need to sort out our other value. And that value is, do we want to retain the right to remain silent? But that's the first part of what I wanted to, to share with you insofar as reflections are when it comes to mobile phones. Because mobile phones form part of our ecosystem. An ecosystem where we live online and we live offline. So we have several ecosystems, cyberspace and meat space, as some people call it. Um, other developments that I've been looking at also relate to mobile phones, but relate to everything else. And I will admit to a, an element of self-interest here, <coughs> because one thing that I am doing is I am encouraging everybody to adopt military-grade encryption. Make it part of your lives. <clears throat> Amongst other things, of course, because at this moment in time, when Joe uses his military-grade encryption, it's like painting a target on his back. Oh, look at me. I might have something interesting going on. <laughs> but if everybody loses, uses it, then hey, I'm lost in the crowd. So that's my self-interest. But joking apart, it's also very important. Now, I've always told my daughters, and indeed most of my students, um, don't ever put anything down on an email that you wouldn't like to see on the 8 o'clock news. And many people have lived to regret not taking that particular piece of advice. That being said, there are times when you would like to say something confidential, send it in a message, and make sure it's ephemeral, which is why one of the programs that I use not only uses military-grade encryption, but automatically deletes the message from both sides after two hours or a maximum of 24. And I've never missed those messages, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> and neither have any of my friends or colleagues. I have been using various forms of email since 1984, which kind of reveals that A, yes, that I'm young, but I've been younger, and B, that yeah, I've been a kind of a geek in those cases, but particularly here, what I should be referring to is that when we are transmitting messages to each other, and when I've analyzed my flows, and I've kept I've got email archives which go back 20 years, at least. But how many times do I go back to an old email? Even to one which is only eight months old or nine months old. Less than once or twice a year, on average. And that's for really important stuff. Somebody might have sent me a document or archive that there was a message which was particularly compromising to somebody. But in reality, most of the messages that we send, for our personal, from a cognitive science point of view, from the point of view of our cognition, they can be very ephemeral. 
but they do the job. Let me, before I embark on other things, point out a few things which I'm currently doing and which I'd like to take advantage of being here to invite you to participate. If you look at one of my websites, and indeed if you look at my report, you will see that I have identified a set of five priorities. And those are a better understanding of privacy or privacy, um, security and surveillance, health data, big data and open data, and personal data held by corporations. This is not to say that there aren't other important things, but this is to say that this is just about all that I can handle at this moment in time. And one of the things, uh, you can go to this uh, particular uh, page on the website which explains what I call the parallel TAS, uh, um, thematic action streams, which each one of those five topics is benefiting, benefiting from. And in fact, if you go either to this website or to my official United Nations website, <coughs> you can also see, um, with apologies to all the Soviet and Chinese five-year planners, um, my five-year plan. Um, and <coughs> over there, you have a number of themes and the dates of when I would like to report, if I stick around, because I haven't yet decided as to whether I, I, I want to have a second term. Um, there are limits to insanity, ladies and gentlemen, um, even mine. Um, but there you can see a number of reports and themes. And this is my open invitation to you to please look at them and please contribute in any way, shape or form, which you think you're able to. Everybody's welcome. I'd like to be everybody's special rapporteur and... Wherever I go, I'm always learning something. So please don't think that your contribution could be too small or too trivial. If you have something to say, um, my parents have somehow worked out things in a way that to my surprise, there's only one Joe Kanatachi on the planet, which means you have no excuses with Mr. Google out there. You can find me if you can't get my email address immediately. I'd love to hear from you. Okay, so basically, in this first year, I've done 20 trips, it's now more, um, and 14 countries, including Australia, Brazil, New Zealand, etc., trying to find out what common themes are. And there are a number of common themes. But let me go on to a couple of morals for today, right? So one of the things about learning from each other's mistakes is something which I always encourage people. And I am old enough <coughs> to have lived through, like yourselves, a number of terrorist organizations. I got nearly blown up in at least three different places, and only one of them was in the UK. The other one was in Germany, the other one was in Italy. Those of you from my generation actually remember when the mortality rate from terrorism was far higher than it is today. And all of us cherish the peace, the relative peace that we live in today. And the caveat I'm going to make now for these examples is that although I'm going to draw them chiefly from Germany and Mexico and the UK, it doesn't mean, and France, it doesn't mean that these are the only countries with problems. <coughs> it just means that these are the only ones I can squeeze in in the time which has been allotted to me. And I thought, in order to move towards a conclusion of today's uh, talk, but there are several more slides to come, um, I thought I'd start off with an Irish example, or an example which was quoted in Ireland, to be more precise. And here I've gone back 10 years to the Data Retention Directive. Because I'd like you to realize what kind of change we've seen in 10 short years. 10 years ago, 
This was the hot topic, data retention, that ISPs and telephone companies are going to be required to retain not the content of data, but the metadata. What time the call took place, who originated, who was it from, who was it to, how long did it take. That was the subject 10 years ago, driven. This was the directive which had the dubious honor of being the fastest one which went through the um, EU. It came just after the 2005 bombings in London and in Madrid. So it went through pretty fast, six months, and we had a directive, which was eventually shot down as being disproportionate. Though, of course, the UK was the first country to rush in and try and replace it. And, of course, the Australians never noticed and did, did one last year. Or d perhaps they did notice. In fact, they did. But they went ahead and did it anyway, which is a sign of the times. And while the data retention saga continues, The German Bundestag, as you see here from the headlines, I've picked a few headlines to go through with you. The German Bundestag last year, following some of the first French attacks, brought in another data retention law after the German Constitutional Court had struck down the first one. And the headlines from last year were that France's sweeping surveillance laws had gone into effect. The point I'm also making here, ladies and gentlemen, that these sweeping surveillance laws did not prevent the French attacks. And I don't know about you, but when it's my turn to do some work in the house, and I'm asked, for example, to put up a picture on the wall, I use a hammer, not a sledgehammer. It was the sledgehammer would mean I have no war left. And the point that I'm going to make by the end of this talk this morning, ladies and gentlemen, is will we have a democratic society left if we keep using the sledgehammer laws which politicians seem to have grown so fond of? Of course, the French story did not stop there because a couple of weeks ago, the French court found it unconstitutional. And now they have one year in which to go back to the drawing board and come back. Will the French secret services stop using the technologies they have? Of course they won't. In the same way as GCHQ has never stopped, has it, ladies and gentlemen? And I say that knowing full well that I am in the region where there is the largest number of GCHQ <coughs> Outside, staff outside Cheltenham. And of course, this is what Les Allenby was referring to first. And these aren't my words, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not saying that I disagree with them. But yes, the UK has brought in the most intrusive law. I am happy about one thing that the discussion which took place has produced a stronger oversight mechanism that, than existed previously. That's an improvement. And it kind of makes me, you know, I won't say I, it puts me in I told you so mode, but when last year some people were looking and saying, ah, Joe Kanataji has said that the UK has the weakest oversight regime, well, perhaps I was right, because they've gone ahead and changed it, haven't they? But what else has happened? And if you look at the law which I had labeled as worse than scary, and that was a full year ago, I'm going to ask you, and I'm only using a few headlines here, 
who can see your entire internet history, Taxman, DWP, Food Standards Agency, etc. Are we back to the lovely old days when your local council can look at you? so much stuff under RIPA as it was then and decide as to whether it's going to put cameras in wheelie bins because in fact it's true that this law and this is the greatest shame and Les I suspect was referring to it too in so far as the public is concerned it's gone through with barely a whimper as the Guardian said which is very worrying because if you wanted to catch me in an optimistic mode, I would tell you, and I'm very happy to say so, that never has privacy been in the news as much as it has been in 2016. So for somebody like myself, that's good news. Because in the 33 years and plus which I've been working in the field, that is really good news. There's more awareness. But the question is, is there enough awareness? And my answer is categorically no. Especially when I think about mobile phones and the internet. In a lot of the research projects that we've carried out even before my appointment to SRP, we found out that people may be conscious as to perhaps a picture they've put online, as to the content in other words, as to something they may have said or tweeted, and not always, but when it comes to the existence and the potency of metadata, most people just haven't a clue. Yet, I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, if you had to ask any intelligence service worth, worth its salt, if you had to give up one, if you had to give up either content <coughs> or metadata, what would you give up? And inevitably, they answer, I'll give up the content any day, but I want to keep the metadata, because the content may lie, but the metadata does not. And this is why, of course, I have five phones and I keep lying to my heart's content, just to keep them guessing. But please don't let them in on that. They know about it. Um, well, let's go to Germany for a minute, right? So the Germans started off this year rather well. They said that one of the anti-terrorism laws is partly unconstitutional. But then they bang went through the rest of my summer because by June, July, the, crowd, the, the clouds, the grey clouds had started gathering. And by September, October, I got this freakingly lousy law. In fact, it's now official. I can say it officially. Germany now has a worse oversight system than the Brits do. Who would have thought of that a year ago? I feel as if I'm awarding one of those, what did they call them, rotten tomato prizes, you know. <laughs> and, um, and one of the really funny, sad, I should say, things is that they've made the Germans have articulated in the law something which the Brits have in other things and the Americans in others. And they've said, you know what? Let me just show you something to make you think how silly this is. You know what this is, of course? The passport. And they've said, are you a German citizen? Fine. We shall exempt you from some things. Are you an EU citizen? Okay, okay, we're not going to look too closely at you. But everybody else is fair game. Now that struck me as being daft on at least two counts. Number one, has anybody checked the passports of all the terrorists we've had in France and Belgium and the UK over the past few years? To my knowledge, except possibly for one, they were all EU passports. So what do we do about those? So are we really addressing a risk? Or are we doing something else? Are we using the law to legitimize some other kind of activity? Secondly, and perhaps it's my poor English, 
When I read Article 12 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or Article 17 of the ICCPR, it says everybody has the right to privacy. It doesn't say EU citizens have the right to privacy. It doesn't say American citizens have the right to privacy. So in my book, privacy should not depend on the passport in your pocket. Privacy is a fundamental human right. And if you're a government or an oversight agency which is self-respecting, you should make sure that everybody's privacy is protected, not just that of your citizens. And in fact, if we look at, I mean, the Germans under surveillance rules even made the news in Ireland. Um, there are other dimensions to this, of course, as I reminded you first, it's not only privacy, it's also freedom of expression, which comes into play. When you know that somebody's monitoring you, is there a chilling effect on what you're going to say? And of course, I mean, I could go on about that. And this is actually something that came up between, since last week. The Germans are really deciding to ruin my Christmas. I've got to have a word with the minister. Um, in fact, I've <laughs> formally asked to see them now. Um, they, they're thinking about introducing a law which is even more going in the wrong direction. But let's go, stop for a minute and think about what's been happening in the United Kingdom. So this, this was the news from last year, actually. Not this year. This was last year. UK-US surveillance regime was unlawful for seven years. And then we got this, which was part of the concessions we got this year, where it was established in the relevant UK court that GCHQ had far overstepped its limits when it was infringing on the rights and on the privileges of lawyers and their clients. And then, once again, when we look at what the Investigatory Powers Tribunal found and declared on the 17th of October, I don't know how many of you have read that judgment. I would heartily recommend it to you. Because if you need, you know, if you miss Hammer House of Horror, you should read a judgment. Um, for those of us, once again, from my generation. Um, I didn't put these. I didn't put these headlines together, ladies and gentlemen. Your journalists did, um, and of course now the declaration is that what they were doing was unlawful for 17 years. <coughs> so that's almost as soon as we started having these toys, wasn't it? Does the term "I can, therefore I will"? Okay to anybody? And have we seen a usurpation of the mechanisms of democracy? Let me just walk you through a few things which have happened in the United Kingdom over the past few years. In the times of Jack Straw, when I was still actually during that period living in the UK, in the times of Jack Straw we saw a proposal to spend between 11 and 13.1 million, I'm sorry, billion, on the new IMP, as it was called then, the Interception Modernization Program. And this never took off. Then we got the coalition government, where Theresa May wanted 1.3 billion for the Interception Modernization Program. And the coalition said no on human rights issues and privacy issues. Did that stop GCHQ, ladies and gentlemen? Did the old safeguard of not voting power, not voting money to the force that wanted it work? No, it did not. The Americans slipped them 500 million under the table and they did it anyway. And if you look at what at least three members of the UK's intelligence committee 
supposedly entrusted with scrutiny, three of them have openly declared they were never briefed about those programs. So who exactly is in charge, ladies and gentlemen? Let's look at a gem of a document whose author I have now come to know. So, Mr. Google can come to the rescue if you haven't read this yet, ladies and gentlemen. It's called The Operational Case for Bulk Powers. And since my time is very limited and I'm conscious about time going forward, I'm going to restrict myself to just one section. The word bulk. You see, if you utter the words mass surveillance in the presence of the security services or the oversight agencies, you can see the hackles rise, visibly, and they will say, but we don't do mass surveillance. And if you look at the case studies in this document, they're all about somewhere in the Middle East. But if you look at the law, it doesn't say the Middle East. Because, in terms of the new law, which has just received the royal assent, we have a situation where, if somebody so decides, all your devices could be hacked. That's what bulk... Have you noticed the little word there? Bulk equipment interference? Such a lovely euphemism, isn't it? Now, of course, interference is something that many of us dislike, those of us with at least half a legal background. It, it suggests all kinds of impropriety. But bulk equipment interference means that if you decide that you want to hack every single device in an entire town or city, you can do so. And the only difference between now and before is that now we have a law which says, even more than it did before, because before it was being interpreted in the same direction, that yes, guys, we have the power. We can do it. And what I'd like to ask, of course, is, are those four key powers, bulk interception of communications, for those of you um, who are not immediately understanding what that means, it means everything that GCHQ and the NSA is doing in tapping every single fiber optic cable they can lay their hands on. That's what that means. And are you seeing where I'm going now, ladies and gentlemen? That 10 years ago, the discourse was data retention, and now we have laws which are sanctioning and authorizing and legitimizing the vacuuming up of everything. As the police and Sting would have us say, you know, every move you make, every step you make, I'll be watching you. And that's where we are. And they're not content with that. They want the other powers. The bulk interception, the bulk equipment interferes. And let's see, I don't have enough time to go through everything that I found, but let's look at this gem, for example. Right? Does this inspire confidence, ladies and gentlemen? that your data is in the right hands, and please don't get me wrong, there are many upstanding and very conscientious persons working in the secret services. But as in banks, as in police forces, the greatest risk is from the inside. More than 90% of losses in such circumstances come from the inside, and with inside knowledge. And do you really want your intelligence staff sorting through intercepted communications as if they were Facebook posts. But the risk was run. And this also, should I remind you, in a situation where the Commissioner for Interception of Communications clearly said that it was so fragmented that you could not really follow where the authorizations were and when and how long they were. Just look at what Sir Stanley Burton had to say in that report. Let's leave the UK's governmental spin to one side. Um, 
And let me, as I go into the final home straight, remind you of a few other things. Firstly, that particular graph shows you the kind of money that was spent by a number of police forces and secret services around the world to buy Galileo, which is the kind, one, only one brand of the kind of software that can do, can switch on your phone, can switch on your, the camera on your computer, can switch remotely, can listen in, can basically take over the most intimate thing in your life before or after your spouse or partner. Okay, this is what came up this morning. I always try to revise my slides in the morning to see, if, is, wasn't there the, I mean, good grief. I mean, this is what came along this morning. Um, that Rio Tinto plans to use drones to monitor workers' private lives, right? So if you're a miner in Australia, hey, keep your drone radar on because somebody's watching you. And this is what I was talking about before, the standards, right? Necessity, proportionality. And I'd like to finish by talking about proportionality. <coughs> if you'd spare me a few minutes for proportionality. Well, so what does proportionality mean? That the measure you take is proportionate to the risk you're trying to manage. How big is the risk, ladies and gentlemen? Let's look at a few figures, okay? And I'm starting with David Anderson's quote, right? During the 21st century, Terrorism has been an insignificant cause of mortality in the United Kingdom. The annualized average of five deaths caused by terrorism in England and Wales over this period compares with total accidental deaths in 2010 of 17,201, including 123 cyclists killed, 102 personnel killed in Afghanistan, 29 people drowned in the bathtub, and five killed by stings. So, First of all, I'd like to tell you that I have no compelling evidence that those numbers would be significantly higher if GCHQ had not carried out bulk surveillance. But I, being a suspicious sort of chap, I decided to go a bit into great detail. The first one, the first bit deals with, so we have five people killed by lightning strikes every year. So the chance of your being killed in a terrorist attack is roughly at the same odds as you're being hit by lightning. Yet, what kind of measures are we taking? And then ladders, you know how many people die falling off ladders? So 15 people die for, what are we going to do? Ban ladders? Would that be a proportionate measure? Beds, beds is an interesting one. 20 people die from falling out of bed every year. Well, ban beds. Never mind our sex lives, ban beds. Because four times as many people die falling out of bed as we have out of terrorist attacks. Bats, bats is another interesting one. 18 people to 22 people die drowned in the bath. What are we going to do? Ban people from taking baths? Destroy every bat in the country, replace them with shower closets? Or put in cameras in the bath to make sure the people behave properly and don't drown? What's proportionate here? Going to work, of course going to work is, has got a huge one, right? So what do we have? We have health and safety laws. That's what's proportionate. We don't ban people from going to work. And we don't carry out mass surveillance at work, though some people are carrying out mass surveillance at work. Cars, motorcycles, bicycles. So that was 1,645 people who died last year in the UK. What are we going to do, ban cars? ban motorcycles, or perhaps prohibit people from driving and only having driverless vehicles because they're much safer than human beings. What is the proportionate measure? So will somebody please persuade me that watching every single step that you are making, every breath that you are taking, is a proportionate measure? Because frankly, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not there yet. In fact, when you look at the statistics there, you can see that terrorism wouldn't even figure anywhere as a blip there. The final slide is this one. 
the discourse of 2016 of 2006 was about data retention. In 2016, it's about omni-surveillance. All the new laws we are seeing coming in in France, Germany, the UK, want to legitimize the powers of the state to surveil everything. I'm not saying that the intentions are necessarily not good ones, but I'm saying that this is a sledgehammer, that it is disproportionate, its proportionality has nowhere, anywhere coming to be proved, and that we really need to have a rethink on this one. Um, which is, to a certain extent, the antithesis of Article 25 of the GDPR that Les was referring to. Privacy by design, to a certain extent, we seem to be heading towards no privacy by design. Because that's what the law is pushing us to. Thank you very much for your attention, ladies and gentlemen.